Hello everyone, today we talk about Medieval Brabant, an introduction really to the duchy as well. I would have uh, separated uh, the district, like in the original series, from the, the history of the wall country, but in this case I think the blend um, is, is fine. Uh, we do not, in fact, have too much information about Brabant in the early Middle Ages, at least it was one of the many Pagi that existed in uh, in the territory of the Merovingian Empire, right? The name uh, of Brabant was probably given to this land in the 5th century by the same Salian Franks. We're talking the region between the rivers Skeld, Rupel, Ville and Hain. And the etymology of Brabant stems from the... Um, the the old Dutch Brackband, right? It's also tested in Latin as Pagus Brackbatensis as a consequence. This is also a Frankish name, in fact, stemming from the Proto-Germanic Breck, Breckania, meaning fallow, right? So something that had to be broken eventually. Such, and Bant, Bant or Bant, it is district uh, or region, right? Then there is the, the probably Indo European. Bond, bond does, so something useful, beneficial, good, whatever, but this is the, um, say, the standard name, in fact, for, um, for other territories. Um, Brabant initially was really constituted by a single Pagus, right, so uh, a, a village district, fundamentally, and during the early medieval times, we do not have uh, much of evidence uh, about it. In any case, with the Treaty of Verdun in 843, this territory acquired um, um, a greater prominence, greater strategic significance as a frontier area, right? Brabant fell in that agreement that is not the last, definitely. Uh, I made a video about the, the, the partitions of the Carolingian Empire were actually something a bit more complicated than Verdun that sort of, you know... Um, divides in three the, the, the Carolingian Empire, but there were especially in this area of Lotharingia uh, significant adjustments as you know, and fundamentally the area would uh, fail to evolve as a kingdom, differently from the, the other regions practically um, so Brabant fell to Lothair forming however in the uh, in this um border between the, the Germanic and the Romance world, the essentially westernmost part uh, of the former, right? Uh, during the late Carolingian era, Brabant that had grown, or at least had gradually become more productive, was divided into four counties. This can be observed in the Treaty of Mersen of 870. These Counties are the ones of, uh, at least the, the future ones, of Alost, Brussels, Al, and also what would become, in fact, the Ballon Brabant, that is Chèvre Le Saint. This is relevant because, as we've seen in other regional history videos, of course, what, was emer what would emerge within these original districts from Romano-Germanic times um, could be something very in fact, um, independent from that mechanism, especially through uh, the Basilatic beneficiary um, expansion. And this is particularly true for Lotharingia uh, during the, the central centuries of the Middle Ages. As uh, we were observing before, there wasn't really a state that could quite check uh, centrally these guys. So it is the, the entire era, as you know, ended up essentially being part of the of the Eastern Frankish Kingdom. Lotharingia was absorbed by what would become Germany. And yet, the westernmost part of the empire, this was technically uh, it, um, meaning the, the Holy Roman one, as we call it, at least forming in theory, at least in practice, uh, as a separated state of some sort, even though in theory the, the empire was universal and still there, was unable to, in fact, control 
directly. I made a video about this um, from Dachi to Duke Dome um, and essentially observing both Lotharingia and Swabia uh, during Frederick Barbarossa's times, which uh, I think it's quite uh, exemplificative. We didn't talk about Lotharingia much per se, so, so looking at Brabant is one of the, the steps of doing so. We, we talk about, of course, the county of, of Flanders, we talk about and the county of Holland, right? So I plan to extend a bit the, you know, the attention to this area because it, it's sort of complex and sort of, in fact, all complicated because of the lack of a major uh, uh, regional force. But this, in fact, requires a bit more attention to the single polities that um, were able to emerge. Brabant being in Middle Ages actually one of the most successful, to say the least. Um, so, upon the death of Charles uh, the Fat, right, the last of the proper Carolingians, then you have Charles uh, the Bald's lineage that lives on and especially is connected to Brabant in the latter period, we will see it now, um, is um, just uh, the, you look at the last Carolingian period, the counties of Brussels, and Al passed to this local ruler, Lambert I, that was the Count of Lovain. This this is kind of normal, right? With the fragmentation of the Carolingian Empire, you have essentially whichever lord was more powerful at a local level being able to essentially seize other counties just out of his you know, personal power. And Ballon Brabant instead was established by Otto I, as a mark around Enam on the Skeld, uh, having in fact a strategic function against France. I made a video about this um, Western Frankish frontier, the Ottonian Empire and campaigns that were fought here. Well, Ballon Brabant constituted in fact the, 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 the frontier, the militarized frontier that the Ottonians in this moment of actually high power of the of the um, Eastern Frankish Kingdom had managed to, to consolidate, then things, as we were saying later, would get out of hand. I mean, the, the, the power would decentralize um, further. Germany undergoing multiple crises through the, this this period. Um, in, any, in fact, right, this um, Ballon Berbant itself would pass in the early 11th century, in fact at the end of the Ottonian dynasty, to the county of Eno that we have to, to discuss. This is one of the other, as you know, most important um, uh, principalities in, in the area. Um, and Valon um, Brabant at this point under the Counts of Eno absorbs a large part of the county of Al in the process as well. Not entirely. Um, it's very patterned. There are some. This is true for the same, um, say, national linguistic borders, but properly the same feudal districts, right? Nothing so definitive or well outlined or even entirely clear in terms of what, for example, the ducal power had to be uh, identified with, right? With the creation of some vassalatic lordships that sort of were more important, in fact, than ducal authority as well. This is, this is a problem. Uh, we will see it better in the video properly about the, the Duchy of Lower Lorraine that would be essentially emerging from, the, uh, from Lotharingia in, the, in this area. And I explained it, in fact, also in that other video about uh, these lands in Barbarossa's times. Um, of course, the German market would play this area, but always in a much more decentralized way than, say, you know, the, the Rhineland, doesn't matter how close they were to, to an extent, but still they, they were sort of out of the main, main say, direct expansion routes and uh, general interests. And part of the reason is that it was very difficult to centralize as well from, from these areas. It was an area that, as you will see now, is, is, now is, is famous also for its military capacities, the fact that this relative lawlessness allows 
even certain social stands to be more powerful. Think about the uh, Flemish infantry, but the Brabantine one specifically. We'll see it now uh, with the, uh, you know, think about Boringen, for example. But um, in general, the Brabanson. I made a video years ago about this. You know, it becomes synonymous with this sort of scum of the earth of uh, mostly foot mercenaries that were, but also brigands and sort of common criminals that would create, especially during the 12th century, uh, the which which witnesses the expansion of this area, uh, uh, remarkably, but still, again, without a centralized control, um, with the tour, uh, especially France, right, sacking, pillaging, raping, etc., and still being pretty warlike, pretty pretty tough, especially in this foot um, uh, compartment. Let's say it's a bit more complicated than that. Of course, Brabanson is a synecdoche. This, these people came a bit from everywhere, but still, this area uh, was experiencing an important demographic, economical growth. Um, you know that the towns, men of these areas, were sort of more autonomous historically. In spite of the, this is true mostly for Flanders. This area was heavily feudal in nature, but still. The fragmentation allows certain towns to experience some important autonomy, and in fact, infantry warfare stands always out uh, compared to the uh, the European outrage, um, uh, especially the feudal one, the feudally dominated areas one um, in the military history uh, of Brabant specifically. Uh, in the early 11th century. Also, the Counts of Flanders conquered the region between the Skeld and the Dent rivers. This was part of the Brabantine land of Alost, right? So you see, this, the Counts of Flanders were very powerful at the time. The, the 11th to 12th centuries are moments of, you know, considerable um, might of um, the county, as we've explained in the dedicated video, only in the 13th century you have that system sort of um, collapsing the feudal element, or at least having the, the towns gaining much more power, and exceptionally so uh, in this area of Europe. Uh, and so there would be a bit less pressure, but the counts of Flanders really had impressive armies, and they could properly carry out differently, actually from the, um, the nobility of Brabant, sort of for for the for the scale here but provincial size and sort of fairly orderly expansion by the end of the 10th century the counties of Brussels and Hull were in the hands of the last of the Carolingians these were again uh, the Dukes of Lothier we're talking about the person of uh, Charles of Lorraine in in the last, this was essentially the son of Louis IV of France and Gerberga of Saxony. Um, this is still the phase of contrast between the Western Frankish monarchy before the rise of the Capetians and the... Uh, I mean, this would continue also after the Capetians, but the, 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 the royal house of Germany in general. This was still somehow hot frontier, so what happened is that um, uh, Charles would um, uh, he was essentially brother of, of Lothair of France right? who had inherited the kingdom of the Franks and in 977 Charles was expelled from the, the, the kingdom uh, after having accused Lothair's wife of infidelity that's why he had sought refuge at this point with Emperor Otto II and the latter, in order to exploit this, um, you know, illustrious, at least dynastically speaking, um, individual, and the fact that he had taken refuge in his lands, decided to provide him with a title of Duke of Lower Lotharingia, or of Lower Lorraine. Um, and this is relevant because it, it shows not just um, an attempt to create a sort of buffer state, um, with the Western Frankish Kingdom through the basis still of some pretense right from the from a dynastic point of view of fostering a parallel 
dynasty hopefully it could rival with with the uh, with the uh, one that had uh, he had fallen out of grace of but also trying to sort of um, not not showing too much anxiety about the possibility of course of this individual to maintain a much greater um, power in this era that was probably already at the time seen as sort of destined to some degree of fragmentation so also this um, ducal power was seen as just um, easy to manipulate in some way especially at the time uh, of the height of the Ottonian dynasty in any case this guy was depending on them so that when Charles dies and this is the time of Otho II premature's death, uh, Otho III's minority, the general Germanic interest in the Italian peninsula, and so the gradual, again, um, decentralization of Lotharingia, that the counties of Brussels and Al, as we were saying before, passed to Lambert, the Count of Love. Right, Lambert died um, in 1015, so you, you see this is the moment properly of uh, already and just after the, uh, the the extinction of the same uh, Ottonians. These territories were secured by Lambert's uh, house, the one of Regnier, the Counts of, of Love, and his family uh, were very powerful. They owned uh, rich lands in central, today's central Belgium, uh, and they would pursue uh, the most unprejudiced, actually, uh, territorial policies um, uh, as a, in order to essentially establish um, an even greater principality on their own, right? And this unprejudiced um, behavior is showed by the fact that they would often engage in fights against the same Holy Roman Emperors, um, the bishops of the imperial church that at this point had somehow will look at the sort of ecclesiastical administration of Brabant later, but it was, you know, the territory was mostly under the um, the imperial diocese. And um, this was possible as, again, the, the local central authority was starting to fade, and so these guys decided to build their own, right? Um, and this is really the, the princely foundation of... Uh, of Brabant historically as a as the core of the feudal polity and uh, the rest of the Middle Ages uh, and beyond. Right. Uh, the union of the Brabantine counties of Brussels and Al with the county of Lovain that was uh, in turn a fragment of the ancient Pagus of Esbai formed the basis of this new territorial principality. So we see Lambert I uh, in succession, his sons Henry I, who died in 1038, Lambert II, who ruled from 1041 to 1063. Then you have his sons, you have his grandson Henry II, ruling between 1063 and 1079, and Henry III from uh, 1079 to 1095. These rulers would unite to the south the Romance land belonging to the abbeys of Nivelle and Jean Bleu, um, that of which they became their advocates, lay advocates. Uh, as you know, the, the abbots did not have uh, higher justice uh, faculty as far as you know capital punishment and at Similia, so the sense was, at least in this case, actually taking control of these uh, foundations and essentially uh, protecting them with their military capacity and the fact again uh, uniting them to their uh, to their personal power. To the east they control as far as the, the area of Tienhen and in the north the majority of the old Toxandria uh, were Breda and the, um, the Ducal Forest would later arise. The Ducal Forest is quite important. It's the, the Zonian wood, uh, the Zonian wood in, in Dutch, that also 
constitutes actually a, a barrier between the uh, say the, the the Germanic world and and the Romance one had divided in these areas in that point for a long time, which exemplifies the typical interland of of this area. It was fundamentally very akin to to Germany. This uh, region was all to be sort of deforested, reclaimed, um, in order that the 11th to 12th century, in parallel to, to this feudal expansion, would witness the enormous, uh, let's say, land uh, and people engineering, right, in terms of settlement, of, uh, you see, in the, in the low lines, for example, the canonization, uh, deportation of, of, of people that would be settled in some better land, uh, would be incentivized to, to settle in the, the areas that uh, the noble men had invested for preparing for them to have more manpower, labor force, uh, and so on. And again, in, in these areas, there is a, a very important rise. These are those parts of Europe that arrive a bit later, sort of in the, uh, the level of development, but during the Middle Ages, rise in relative terms faster than the richest ones. Uh, and so have this greater drive, very often actually out of despair, like we, we tend to think of the, again, the, the, the revival of the year 1000, something like, you know, it's just they, they had new technology, right, that uh, increased their crop yield. Absolutely false, right? Especially, actually, in some of the areas that expanded the fastest, there is no evidence of this whatsoever. It was just very hard work, sweat and tears, um, that, uh, however, this rough yet determined population was carrying out. Um, in 1106, the Count Godfrey I, ruling between 1095-1140, that was the brother and successor of Henry III, received the title of Duke of Lotharingia from Emperor Henry V. Right. This was a mean of cooptation that the Salian ruler used to maintain some control in this area. And it's very meaningful that he would choose um, uh, the local nobleman of Brabant. And this is how actually the Duchy of Brabant, quite uh, unusually in terms of feudal formality, was born. Because the title of Duke of Lotharingia did not, first of all, immediately increase the actual power of the holder, right? It was just a formal um, title that, yes, was helping as far as the, the public authority in the region was concerned, but that was done rather because, as, as it often happened, like this is true for the same German election uh, to Kur, like because, you know, we appoint you ruler, but you don't have to to bother us more than much, right? So, actually, some of the emergent powers, the ones that were not an immediate threat, would be chosen for this. But when you look at what happened in the following centuries, you realize that, gradually, the practice of refer referring to the Duke and the Duchy of Brabant was introduced. So, this was actually the title of the Lutheran Duke, but Brabant is so central to this um, feudal process that the Duke of Lotharingia becomes basically the, Dutch, uh, the, the Duke of Brabant, right? Um, that's how things work in, in Western um, part of the of the Holy Roman Empire. And only by the 13th century, however, the title of Lotharingia fell de facto completely into disuse, right? This was an important um, provincial nomenclature of the Holy Roman Empire, the Kingdom of Germany. Specifically, like saying the, the Duchy of Saxony or the Duchy of, of Bavaria, etc. So, this was a historical province, but again, it's so feudally dissolved that you can basically have one of the local districts emerging as the actual lead. At least, most at least it doesn't quite the Duchy of Brabant doesn't quite overlap Lower Lorraine. This is pretty large, right? It's just like all the, also far in the north, all the lowlands, to the, the, the North Sea, etc. It encompasses other areas, but this uh, the Duke of Rabat is 
uh, assumes the, the title of the Duke of Lotharingia, and it's in this sense the Brabant gets the is elevated, right? Gets the the, the title Duchy as such, right? In the uh, feudal hierarchy of the empire, this is particularly important because otherwise, as you can see also from from the maps I inserted here, um, it, it's never a particularly large territory, right? In the you know even a, at a regional level so but it, it is definitely uh, one of the most successful as far as its its development right you have so i don't know the, the dutch of Luxembourg that is uh well at some point it's comparable if you want to the, the, the county uh the county of uh Hainaut, um etc there's the, the bishopric of liege for example so we will talk about all these lands at some point because uh, they they were Gelder, Limburg, right? We'll see now what the sex, the succession crisis in there broke to. Um, in any case, important step uh, in Brabantine history. Um, under the title of Duke, the House of Lovain also acquired the Marquisate of Antwerp thereby uniting the Brabant with that part of to the ancient Toxandria that had remained separated from it until then. Um, Godfrey I, his son Godfrey II, um, so we're talking from 1140 to 1142, and his grandson Godfrey III, between 1142 and 1190, dedicated as Dukes of Brabant, most of their efforts to firmly establish their authority also domestically, right? Because now the, their elevation to to dukedom was relevant enough. These are the years we were covering uh, in the video about Barbarossa. Uh, is uh, is to be recognized also by the surrounding nobility of this other uh, vassalatic districts that are not and lordships that are not particularly thrilled of course uh, by seeing just these guys getting all this power and so there are feuds uh, clashes it's, it's quite complex moreover um, the the system as a well whole was increasing importance just relevantly that this, the second half of the 12th century in Germany is the moment of acquisition of the uh, fuller Western Frankish uh, model of government, culture, uh, and more. Um, so these lands become better administered feudally. They become sort of the, the more concentrated in power and uh, internationally recognized, and they, they have a say uh, in the imperial diet in this case. Um, the connections between the major economic centers of Flanders with the ones of essentially the neighboring Rhine are the, the urban um, social consequence of this, right? Um, the Rhineland was one of the more advanced areas in Europe at the time, um, and also because of the local, of, of the, the archbishoprics, uh, chiefly the ones of, of Cologne, um, that uh, connected it with, with other centers uh, in the south and with Aachen, you know, were, were, would bring um, Brabant sort of closer to the to the imperial dynastic issues uh, of the uh, of Germany, and uh, as such, also to the institutions, to the to the neuralgic neuralgic center of of German politics. Um, Brabant just geographically served as a natural intermediary uh, between Flanders and the Rhine, right? There was no need to introduce, again, Flanders. This, this were, again, also one of the more, uh, especially economically, tri uh, thriving centers um, of in Europe, especially because of its town markets, their textile industries. Brabant is just in, in between that and the Rhineland. So this would, by osmosis, bring new industrial and commercial life to, to the, the same land, the broader area. And, of course, as we were pointing out, the other... The Brabant is not particularly urbanized, but when you look at this 
sort of string of sad laments and we were noticing that the other day when that video about medieval European cities you realize as we pointed out that essentially the, the, the areas of major urbanization in medieval Europe are will also correspond to the ones of greater um, fact local GDP uh, today in Europe right this this era essentially going from from the UK well, okay the UK sort of industrialized at a much bigger more intense level but say from London through the Netherlands the, the Rhineland um, southern Germany northern central Italy this is essentially the um, the area of greatest and sort of continuous also urbanization that also changes by uh, uh, some branches got atrophied for example the French one uh, in the later Middle Ages, but sort of rainforest and um, this in Brabant, in fact, still today some of the, the richest regions um, overall, like in the uh, as some of the most industrialized and populated in Europe, right? Um, around the comital castles of Brussels and Louvain at this point, along the road from uh, Bruges to Cologne, this towns emerged as true centers of production and trade at this point. Uh, just like in Flanders, the wool industry, uh, initially utilizing local wool, but later, as you know, predominantly English wool, as the system was becoming ever more international, became the essential element of these centers' activity. And um, of other less important towns like Nivelles, Terlemont, uh, Lille, and uh, Villeborde. Their populations, by the way, needed laws and institutions capable especially of protecting them from external re feudal threats. Uh, this year, especially again, the, the interland uh, Brabant as a wall was, at the time, had not been up to that time particularly developed. Right, it's just at this point things are changing, and so it's overwhelmingly, as we we're talking about before, a feudal war. So these communes start, um, you know, issuing their um, their laws. They, they establish their, they formalize their their conciliary uh, institutions, and they cope with uh, the feudal authority. It was always there, right? This this was a uh, feudally controlled system, but still getting more important, right? And also for the, this, these rulers to actually basing their own power on a, on a logistical, financial level, for example. Uh, the Duke Henry I, ruling between 1190 and 1235, uh, and his son Godfrey III, were directly involved in this urban development, dealing with the communities, providing them with rights, charters, in 1229, importantly, Brussels got its first charter. Um, contemporarily with this, you have the first walls in, in the town. Right? This is remarkable. It tells you how, after all, not particularly urbanized these places had been up to that point. Right? They didn't even have technically a city wall that in other parts of Europe was sort of the, the hallmark of, in fact, uh, at least a you know, a, a real civitas, right? Around the same time, um, other Brabantine cities obtained similar concessions, albeit with a delay um, of almost a century compared to the Flemish towns that were much more dynamic and were living, as we were recalling before, in a sort of um, uh, feudal collapse in the area and could thus profit much uh, quicker much more quickly from that, uh, creating leagues and so on. From a religious perspective, Brabant was divided between the Archdiocese of Cambrai, which influenced the western part of the region, and the one of Liège, in the, um, that was under the authority of Cologne, right, uh, and encompassing the eastern, the southeastern zone, basically. These two ecclesiastical centers uh, influenced Brabantine art specifically. Uh, the area around the Meuse Basin, 
so the, the one corresponding to the diocese of Liege, made it more connected with a sort of more archaic uh, German region, while the Skeld area that corresponded to the diocese of Cambrai was linked to France, and particularly to Tournai in terms of Romanesque architecture, like pushed hard uh, in these areas, right? Uh, Tournai was officially recognized as a as a bishopric on its own in 1146. Um, so you have in this time in history the the gradual expansion, like to Romanesque, eventually uh, Gothic, like this gradual victory, let's say, of uh, the style, and as we've seen, the same feudal um, rule courtly uh, society and literature, etc., in this more eastern parts of, of um, in fact, of the Frankish world that had remained, again, much more isolated. There was still much more of a world of the forest. You can see it in the, in the art of Germany, still, you know, sort of displaying this, uh, not really obscurity, but the world still wrapped around... Um, you know, the, the forest in itself with mm, more uh, primitively carved figures emerging just uh, out of this while, I don't know, the French were exper- and the English were experimenting the the transparent Gothic spiritual um, ideology and architecture and, um, and uh, feudal system that was being perfectioned there and just pouring like sort of being pumped in the veins of, of these neighboring areas at this point. Um, as a consequence, through this important um, civilizational output received from the West, at the beginning of the 13th century, Brabant had become a first-rate principality in Europe, um, and especially provided with significant autonomy in the region. The authority of the Holy Roman Emperor, which had been declining since the end of the 11th century, was no longer felt in the duchy. This is a historical datum. You would have, at the end of the Middle Ages, the Habsburgs sort of coming back because of their Burgundian legacy in the the Low Countries. Um, But that's another story. Like, properly, the, the Germanic Empire wouldn't essentially set foot in a consistent way in, in this area. And this means big money for, for those guys who have established a consistent power, like in the, here in, in this case. Um, the re- the, don't get me wrong, like the, the era would never be forgotten or not considered part of the, of the German system. Um, just it would remain truly much um, more on its own and hardly reached by any concrete policy of, of the German rulers. The uh, power of the bishops of Cambrai and Liège, who shared spiritual power, was strictly limited to religious matters as well. The Dutch of Brabant was truly um, unchallenged, uh, in this sense, the neighboring counts of Flanders, Eno, and Namur were also some mites to be reckoned with, um, and they, they would be respected, however, due to a line of fortified castles all, along the border that had been settling during the centuries. However, this stability was used, of course, by the Brabantine dukes to seek expansion. Um, in, in, in territory. Uh, Henry I, in line with the commercial interests of the Brabantine towns, aimed, for example, to secure communications between his land and the Rhine, so ex- expanding fundamentally in the, in the east. Um, he tried to weaken the Episcopal Principality of Liège just to exploit the current conflict uh, at the beginning of the 13th century between the anglo Guelph party, represented by John uh, of England and Otto IV of Brunswick, and the franco ghibelline party, that is Philip Augustus and um, Philip of Swabia I, I made a bit about that, the competition with, with, Otto, with Otto IV, how this affected the Rhineland specifically, 
Uh, and then Frederick II. It, it sort of yeah. sounds weird, uh, like Franco Ghibelline. Um, but that's how at the beginning they really were. And Brabant actually stuck with the wealth side overall, right? The, it, this was, um, I would say, obvious in a way because the consolidation of an imperial power too close to to its boundaries would have been too dangerous. The French were not at that point really interested in extending east and they had essentially to uh, tame the English threat and sort of reconquering especially the, the southern part of, of their kingdom Occitania. So um, it's as if Brabant could be suspensed in this space, especially not considering that it was an imperial subject, not making the the German rulers more powerful than necessary. So they chose that side, um, and it was this was not even just a definitive move because, of course, imperial power would reactivate at some point, uh, even during princely Germany, where some rulers could still sort of uh, be supported, or at least support, in turn, uh, the Brabantine foes uh, in the immediate uh, proximity, um, creating quite a headache. In any case, um, Henry was quite effective as he pursued a policy of balance. He managed essentially to isolate um, the, the the bishopric of Liège seized control of the crossing of the Moz uh, river at Maastricht which he shared um, at that point with, with, the, with the archbishop and to even plunder Liège in 1212 right? the major setback which is an important um, battle in Flemish history is the famous Brabantine defeat at Steps in 1213, right? It was fought um, Steps in modern-day Belgium. Um, the battle was fought on October the 13th uh, between, in fact, Henry, Duke of Brabant, and Hugh Pierpont, the Bishop of Liège. And it witnessed, um, or right, this is already evident at the beginning of the 13th century, but even before, the prominence of infantries. In these areas, the the, the Brabanson broadly meant, but the, properly the the militia of Liège that was really, you know, it was quite effective on, on the battlefield. The Brabantine um, route was was disastrous. They were pursued for kilometers, um, and this at least kept Brabant at bay for a while. Um, and it really witnesses, however, in this army's composition, also the the Brabantines had significant infantry like the again the town element in this uh, in this landscape right very few will but still fragmented enough to have the towns carving out their own power even if under the bishops like in this case uh, and others uh, but still being there and counting in any case the Brabantine expansionistic policy was continued by uh, Henry's son Henry's namesake Henry II 1235 uh, 1248 and his grandson Henry III, 1248 1261, gradually established a sort of protectorate over the lands lying between Brabant and the Rhine. This was again the more important direction, and it, it went in parallel, as we've seen, in an aggressive sense to the weakening, after all, of imperial authority in a broader sense. John I, ruling between 1261 and 1294, the son of Henry III um, expanded and consolidated these territories further. Following the death of the Duchess of Limburg, 1283, uh, which opened a, an important succession crisis, supported by the nobility of his duchy and the militias of his cities concerned about the needs of their trade and industries, Allied, in turn, with the citizens of Cologne, whose interests were aligned with those of Brussels and Leuven, John sought to take control of the Duchy of Limburg, 
right? And this led actually to the greatest victory in Brabantine, Brabantine Middle Ages, um, Brabantine history really as a, as a, you know, autonomous polity at this point. The Battle of Warringen fought on June the 5th, 1288. Um, this was fought by the Brabantines against the Archbishop of Cologne in a coalition of princes from the Rhineland, including the Counts of Luxembourg that were in a short while to actually be elected uh, kings of, of Bohemia, right? And this battle is quite important uh, for the history, uh, again, of uh, the region's infantry as well, because the same Archbishop of Cologne is captured by the peasants of Berg that were equipped with um, some weapons known as scandalabras that are similar conceptual to the Gödenbach, that is actually the Jepimdestaba um, in Flemish, that are sort of iconic in, in um, as far as the Battle of Kortrek is is, um, is concerned. But actually, we do not even know whether they use that sort of more, um, say, bulkier, conic, like almost club pointy stick, in fact, um, with a, the spike on top. Uh, or the candelabras, because there are different sort of uh, candlesticks, if you if you prefer, um, that are uh, depicted in different sources. In fact, differently as the same, say similar but not the same weapons. Uh, I will make a video about that. But I discussed it in the video about the Battle of Courtrai, Courtrai, um, and we'll keep talking again about the Flemish warfare because it's quite fascinating. They're sort of similar, right? They are the same mold. Um, and these guys played an important role uh, in battle line, and we will make a video about the Battle of Warringen, uh, hopefully. Uh, but this battle was very consequential, especially in a political sense, because um, it uh, led, with the Brabantine victory, to the definitive personal union, dynastically, of Limburg with the same Brabant, and it led eventually to the incorporation um, of the lands beyond the Meuse River. We're talking about Fokemont, uh, Rolduc, Dalem, into the Duchy of Brabant. So further territorial expansion uh, in a peak, uh, essentially, of, of the country's history together with but like the, the peak of medieval civilization at the time, um, the victory at Voringen um, marked, again, the success of the Brabantine dynasty's policy in general. It fostered also a sense of loyalty and Brabantian um, patriotism, right? This is evident, for example, in the beautiful work by Jan van Helu, um, the Ring Chronic, uh, that tells the history of Brabant between 1261 and, in fact, the glorious victory of 1288, right, the deeds of the Duke John I, the Battle of Warringen, and um, it, uh, it it really speaks of the emergence of a, of a provincial-scale pride identity identifying, in fact, with the feudal power that had led to to the expansion also of the towns, uh, had emerged victorious over his enemies, so making the, the system profiting, right? And there is, in fact, in this area also a um, uh, particular welfare at the beginning of the 14th century, due in part to this um, breakthrough, essentially, the, the incorporation of Limburg, etc. The, um, the, this uh, period witnesses the bull industry boom, right? Trade uh, increased dramatically in importance. Brabantine merchants competed with those from Flanders, in spite of the much better location that, that the latter enjoyed um, in the fairs of Champagne. Traditionally, uh, admittedly, the latter had been declining, as you know, you know. So, we, but you still find Brabantine merchants in France, uh, in Italy, right? And we we do know that. I don't remember when we talk about this. Um, I think in the video about the German and the Italian trade comparison, uh, or something, the one about 
textile about uh, the Silk Road. Well, okay, but we were talking about like an internationalization of Brabant, right? And some skilled uh, craftsmen, personnel that found even job and fortune in, in other in other territories, uh, exporting, uh, copying, if you want, even the um, the Flemish textiles. In fact, in these very years, are started being copied to perfection, if not actually surpassed by the Italian manufacturers that in some cases were hiring, in fact, as Brabantine um, uh, merchants and weavers that knew, in fact, the, the craft and helped in the process. So that's quite fascinating. The economic prosperity, however, led to uh, some unregulated growth uh, at a social level and the, the mid-14th century still witnesses the overall international crack and crisis um, that um, triggers, as you know, in the more urbanized areas of Europe, the um, let's say the rise of the, the popular classes, or at least properly of the fourth estate. Um, you see this, even just the, the demographic increase in Leuven in 1356 and in uh, Brussels in 1357, the walls were had been expanded further significantly even in spite of the crisis uh which is which is interesting because it still um i mean it shows that uh, brabant still enjoyed a significant drive again those who arrive later usually have this sort of extra uh time like in uh, uh, chronologically speaking they, they gained what they have to gain also slightly later and also out of the crisis of the major crisis of their rivals I mean Flanders I made a video about this in the first half of the of the 14th century even before the black that was was suffering a very deep political crisis so the Brabantines really profited of, of this as well uh, Duke John II ruling between 1294 and 1312 and uh, John III uh, from 1312 to 1355. So these were the respectively son and grandson of John I. Essentially continued just the, the political line as their grandfather. And the, under the rule, uh, uh, the Duchy of Brabant proved to be so strong that all the efforts made by its rivals namely the Count of Flanders, uh, Louis of Nevers, and the Duke of Luxembourg, John the Blind, right? Uh, John of Bohemia, right? So not just, uh, you know, irrelevant figures. We talk about Louis of Nevers again, about that crisis. Um, I mean, the, the video about, I don't remember how it's started, but I think it's like Kings of France, the Counts of, um, of Flanders, and the Flemish cities that, Flemish communes that, tells like who, who this guy was in that context but John of Bohemia as you know was uh, an errant king if you want and uh, quite of a knight and he tried to in fact he fought against the Brabantines as well but you had also the Bishop of Liege that had not really forgotten the, the Brabantine expansion had you know um, a lot to districate himself with in order to to, to get uh, this Brabantine influence of um, Adolf of La, uh, Lamarck, right? Um, oh, they all tried to overthrow Brabantine power but in vain. Um, in 1347, at the meetings in Saint Quentin, the Duke John III of Brabant emerged as the most powerful prince in the Low Countries, right? This is the year actually the arrival of the black that at least in southern Europe and part of the reason why he succeeded in this was not just the previous position of Brabant again that was quite um, quite solid as we've seen and that had profited especially of the weakening of Flanders but in fact the fact that especially the latter aspect had brought to uh, the the, the French kings to support the same Brabant in this, right? Uh, John III definitely represented the French party, right? And uh, he managed to unite the city of Mechelen to his duchy as a, as a consequence as well, right? The fact that Brabant uh, stuck to the Guelph system uh, was quite, quite useful, quite fruitful 
um, after all, Flanders, as you know, the, the French had been fighting in, in the county of Flanders, and they had tried to take it over. And they had really failed in terms of direct control, but they had significantly weakened the local commune, so they basically won. Um, and at least through the, the count of Flanders, this was um, how it, it happened. This also opened to the, the English intervention. This is where at the beginning of the Hundred Years' War, because, of course, um, that French extension was threatening the English um, trade of again the wool exports into the the Flemish uh, centers were also in revolt. So a pretty messed up situation, and so just across, uh, just behind Flanders, if you you know if you move east, uh, in between you have the, the county of Hainaut. You have the Duchy of Brabant. So it, it, it's sort of pincer movement that would bring uh, the mm. the French uh, to ally with just the uh, with the Brabantines in the first place, and there is all actually also, you see, the, the area of um, we want even Soissons, Laon, Guise, um, Rem, just for South Chalon, it, it it does protract. It's not that far away after all from the from the Duchy of Brabant. You have just a tiny strip of um, the the bishopric of Liège and the county of Hainaut, but it's immediately just a few tens of kilometers. You are already into Brabantine territory from there as well. So um, there is some important advantage deriving from this, and this is also the direction to which actually the 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 Burgundians, as we will see now, would um, would expand towards this territory. Um, but going back to the to the French party, that the Count of Flanders, Louis of Mal, at that point, whose pa father had acquired Mechelen in 1333 from the B Bishop of Liège, was the one who suffered uh, of the Brabantine acquisition of the same. He was forced by the French to renounce to it. And yet, John III died childless. Um, this was really an issue, as he was succeeded by his daughter, Joanna, who had to marry the strong man of the region, Wenceslas of Luxembourg, um, which again was sort of a was a problem for for Brabant. Think about this: this was a um, again 14th century crisis. Uh, the situation is starting to get destabilized all around. There is an economic crisis, whatever. This is a tendency we have observed also in, in uh, further east in central Europe that it, it, these original enemies prefer, after all, to marry into one another to 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 concentrate as much wealth as possible into a few uh, nobiliar hands di dynastically and try trying to counter in this moment of crisis all those who are essentially rebelling more importantly the nobility right remember that Wenceslas of Luxembourg is the brother of the emperor Charles the fourth right literally the, the son of um, John of Bohemia that died at Crecy just in those years, as you know, blind. Um, but yet, at this level of Schiller, but Charles IV is really... Uh, you're, you're marrying the, the brother of, of the emperor, right? And so it, that's quite a connection for, for Bama as well. And the main threat, in fact, was not coming from, from the Luxembourgs anymore that could exercise some sort of protection on the heiress of the Brabantine fortune. Um, but especially the nobility, and even more the cities, right? Uh, this was, in fact, the, the, the fact that John the Third died without male heirs, uh, the chance for cities and nobility to ask the new duke, as foreign prince, uh, as he actually was, because the, the, the Luxembourgs were not living in Luxembourg anymore. So, even if they were neighbors, uh, ancestrally they uh, had migrated to Bohemia, but of course they were, con they, I mean, they still spoke French, they were uh, still p controlling the territory. We will talk about the, the Count of Luxembourg at some point, because it's really it's really interesting as well. Um, well, they simply granted um, these estates um, the recognition of a general charter that in Brabantine history is quite famous is called the Joyous Entry, sworn on January the third, thirteen fifty six, 
quite of a date, right? As you know, the same one, quite of a year, let's say, had yet to happen, but about of Poitiers, just for some broader context. Yeah, just we've mentioned Crecy, but I also made a video about the Battle of Poitiers and an interesting tactical analysis. But that's the moment of, again, enormous destabilization crisis of the bigger system just in the West, that it was France, right? So it's that messed up. These estates wanted warranties about their um, their future, essentially. And that's what, uh, of course, in times of crisis, you really want. And the charter essentially would remain a constitutional law until the end of the 18th century, right? This, you see, when I say that the Ancien Regime consolidates really in the late Middle Ages, the joyous entry was the constitution of Brabant until the, throughout all the, the Ancien Regime, right? It established the indivisibility of the state um, and the accession of only Brabantines to public functions. So they essentially wanted to maintain a territorial control in the entire territory. Nobody could make concessions to other powers. And those who had to profit from that were just the local elites, the nobility and the patrician ones. Right? And so you, you have that settled. That's how the Ancien Regime works. Crisis of the late Middle Ages and this continuous power in the following century. Right? The involvement of the towns was quite relevant in the government of the duchy, thanks to the joyous entry. So um, definitely these centers, aside from the different destiny that, I mean, not all of them counted in the same way, but uh, aside from the fact this divide were, had, had made it, uh, managed to secure as well, and this was the proof of it, their place in this constitution. These centers had been governed without interruption until the end of the 14th century by an oligarchy of wealthy merchants, right? It was, they were patricians. And um, the most important um, uh, corporation was the guild of draperies, the Lackenwulde. This was happening in parallel, as we were... Uh, remember before, with a series of bloody uprisings of the industrial proletariat, uh, especially in, the, hand, in the, the second half, the end of the 14th century, but also the beginning of the 15th, because again, this, this, uh, these are, it's a bit like England, and again, England and Germany sort of arrive later in that also greater revolts, like there had been, I don't know, in Flanders proper, uh, or in uh, central northern Italy, in, in the cities, in, among the textile workers, or the big jacquerie in France, right, that had followed just the Battle of Poitiers we were talking about before, because, you know, uh, the king had been captured. It was a massive ransom, which everything collapsed, like the peasants said, you know, we work breaking our backs for, for you um, defending us, and you get destroyed, essentially, the kingdom and a king in prison, so that they decided that was the moment to rise. Eventually they failed miserably and completely, like all these these movements. Um, but it wasn't like really uh, just, um, okay, as if nothing had happened. Like massive, um, say, th there was a crisis, but instead of reacting constructively, as always, the fourth estate creates more problems than it necessary. So it get it basically self-destroys itself. Um but it, it destroys also a lot of other resources in, in the process, so everybody gets poorer, and especially them. Um, but yes, there had been some, I don't know, group in the video about uh, the crisis in Flanders, it, I explained how also a bit more complicated the picture is in terms of these guilds and the patricians. There wasn't just like, I don't know, the, the nobility and the, the proletarians. There were also elements in between, there were different guilds, were vertical as horizontal um, divides. Um, in any case, the most important rebellions were the one of Leuven in 1378, um, the one of Brussels in 1421. Um, blood did run, right? These were not like nice uh, events. We're talking about some of the most radical violence that you can imagine it's in a urban context. People cut to pieces, eaten, um, and other pleasantries. 
in any case, again, the situation does stabilize in the end, but of course with the emergence of a richer patriciate and just a few newly enriched that, however, haven't really improved the situation. And going back to dynastic uh, issues, Joanna and Wenceslas actually didn't generate children. That's the Count of Flanders, Louis of Mal, that was husband of Margaret of Brabant, that was Joanna's sister, took advantage um, of a war against Brabant, fought in the, those same fatidic 1356, uh, 1357, to seize Mechelen, which was uh, to, to retake it, basically. Um, this um, was behind the port of Antwerp, and uh, this was, in fact, a dangerous competitor of Bruges as well. So aside from having been a... Uh, a previous territory of, of the Counts of Flanders, it also um, was s sort of a dangerous um, center. You, you see that Antwerp essentially belongs uh, eventually to the, at least this other area. Brabant can be understood as, again, the newcomer a, a bit. You know, that Antwerp, while Antwerp, Amsterdam, and later Middle Ages would, would rise, uh, the uh, the cities of Flanders, Bruges, Gant, um, uh, Ypres, or Brugge, Ghent, and Yepa, if you prefer, uh, would decline compared to right. And so the, of course, the Brabantines had been fueling, as we've seen that that mechanism of disgregation again, the, uh, as long as they handed the the strong um, arm of of France. But the, the most important action by Louis of Mal was to secure some succession prospects in Brabant. Right, Louis of Mal was yet uh, another of the figures that had profited from the reaffirmation of the Ancien Regime at the decline of the Flemish communes that sort of reinforced once again the, the, the feudal communal presence, which had never really died in, in Flanders. Like The communes had not wanted, of course, to take uh, to shake that off. Also, it would have not been possible technically because the county as we have seen was part of of the of the kingdom of france in the first place and there was no other um you know way around that um the most important thing was to secure through um uh, through also the the marriage with margaret of brabant some succession prospects in the same duchy right and these were in fact realized Yet by his son-in-law, that was Philip the Bold, the Duke of Burgundy, like the Valois Burgundy, that was also Count of Flanders and Artois, in 1388, um, by aiding Brabant against Gelders, managed to compel Joanna to choose his second son, Anthony, as her successor. And that's how the Valois Burgundy entered the scene, right? Their shrewd uh, diplomatic, military policy they acquire this territory to their own uh, quite, uh, as you know, quite articulated possessions. I made a bit about the Duchy of Burgundy that is technically not a Burgundian state. Uh, we, we're talking, of course, just about the the actual Duchy within the French kingdom, but that's where they started from. And if you look at the map, as the ones I inserted here, of the House of Valois Burgundy and how much they acquired, well, you realize that um, essentially, from an extensional point of view, the, the Duchy of Brabant was the largest entity uh, of the in the of all these territories that had been acquired within the Holy Roman Empire, right? I mean, more than the County of Flanders, right? Because there were different other territories, like the County of Artois, the County of Hainaut, in between, like so, the, the the extension was not in met. But the Duchy of Brabant, as we've seen, had been secured from Brussels to Breda. Um, the um, and there were these enclaves of Mechelen and Antwerp, from the Moors to um, essentially the 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 Skeld. Uh, this this is a, a massive territory, right? And it uh, it also actually exp actually does arrive to the North Sea as it uh, borders the county of Zeeland, 
right? Uh, with Middelburg, etc. So it's quite an interesting territory. Again, I realize many of it about the county of Holland, but we have we must forcefully talk about these other ones because their interaction is is really is really fascinating. Um, so speaking of the Valois Burgundy in uh, in Brabant, you have uh, Antony who ruled between 1406 between 40 and 1415 his sons John the fourth uh, succeeded him um, in 15 and ruled up to 1427 Philip Philip of St. Paul ruled from 1427 to 1430 it wasn't an easy government right uh, there was a persistent struggle um, that um, um, land by Philip the Good as well um, as the you know leader of the eldest branch of the House of Burgundy were trying to maintain control of Brabant, Limburg due to the, the rebellion the local nobility was not particularly happy right it's not that uh, again they were the most important chunk of this northern part so it would be the most active in this sort of resistance right that the Burgundians were actually very successful but uh, it wasn't as simple as saying, okay, we'll collect all these territories and they will simply remain under us, right? They, they scored particular, particularly high goals here, but uh, there, there were still some, some agitations. This is true for the um, dependencies along the Mulls and the Duchy of Luxembourg as well, the heirs of which Elizabeth of Gerlitz had married Antony in 1409. Uh, the House of Luxembourg too was resistant. Um, the the Luxembourgs, uh, as Holy Roman Emperors, especially under Sigismund, were not just uh, a bit uh, thoughtful and romantic about their ancestral lands, but they that of course meant like they bore the, still the the name. Right, and so it was a matter of like, I'm Holy Roman Emperor, you're challenging me to this. And you know that the Burgundians came to threaten to some important imperial cities such as Neuss, etc. Not with too much uh, success, especially under Charles uh, the Bold, but um, still enough to, to trigger like the problem of like, technically, there is a Holy Roman Emperor, this is Holy Roman Imperial land, what the hell? you know, are these Valois Burgundy guys really doing, right? Of course, this was a uh, a traditional world in which, as we've seen, these duchies and counties were not annexated to some foreign power. They, these rulers were just chosen by the local nobility on the basis of, and, and you know, the local estates and the base of the local charters, constitutions, but the fact there was still an intervention, uh, an absorption of this this territory, this, the, their resources into somebody else's hands. And the Emperor Sigismund did dream, after all, of restoring German authority over the ancient Lotharingia. Historic was still a thing, was still um, uh, real, uh, and there were many options. Again, I made multiple videos about princely Germany. I made a video about the, the Luxembourgs as well in this context, still as late as the 15th before their extinction. We have to talk a bit more about them. Um, in, on October the 5th, 1430, the efforts of the House of Burgundy in any case were successful because Philip the Good was recognized finally as the Duke of Brabant. Um, and from then on, uh, well, essentially, the history of Brabant uh, becomes intertwined not just with the ones of the Valois Burgundy dynasty, but also the one of the Low Countries, because the new princes um, holding the title Dukes of Brabant were, and the one of, of these other provinces, were favoring actually a um, sort of homogenization, uh, um, a union, right, of the local administrator, because these territories were so, after all, fragmented in, uh, compared especially to the Duchy of Burgundy, it was something incredibly concentrated uh, in, uh, in Europe, it was incredibly efficient, and very um, precociously, especially centralized territory, it had lots of immunities, etc., so uh, if it hadn't been for the, the extinction of the Valois Burgundy house, the Plastina, you know, male line, the 
probably the, the French would have awaited a, still a long time, a bit like Brittany, to, to take over the duchy, because it, um, it really had uh, among its own privileges the fact it could not be annexated by the King of France, uh, even though they, they stem from the same Capetian branch, and that was a privilege that had been given exactly for that reason uh, back in the day. Um, but the, the North was much more fragmented again, and this bro prompted the, the Valois Burgundy to try to homogenize these territories, essentially to establish a sort of low country, national, proto national feeling, right? Even from all these various feudal realities, towns that just per se were not necessarily that even uh, identically, you know, feeling very identically connected, uh, just per se. Um, but the fact, of course, that, that that had, because of the feudal leadership, mostly stemmed from the dynastic identities of the various houses, right? So the, the era, of course, did have some, and it was being molded further as well, as some commonality, as something more also ethnically cohesive. And um, yet in all this, of course, um, Bra Brabant and only hit managed to preserve its in individuality because it was the most important. So it was sort of the tougher nut to crack. They felt like they had conquered this territory all, all around. And they, they were sort of the strongest and um, they, they did not like right, just to be uh, grouped to the others as a sort of not of colony, but still something that uh, the deprived of its specificity and ruled by this still de facto foreign house. Um, in in any case, the prelates, nobles, and cities continued to make up the estates of Raban, uh, whose consent was necessarily uh, indispensable for the collection of taxes. A council of Raban served as the final authority and maintained a great deal of authority in the administration of the duchy overseen by the local chancellor. So the, the Valois Burgundy uh, were aware uh, as well of the necessity of this territory that was, by the way, the only, like if you look at fr from the south, you have the Duchy of Luxembourg um, on the Moselle, and then you have in between the, the Prince Bishop Rick of Liege, right? Um, in all, you in actually you have this, this this from one side the Duchy of Limburg from the other that as we've seen is actually part of Brabham. So they compenetrate each other geographically to an extent. The county of Namur with Dinan uh, in the west, and then you have the Duchy of Brabham, and that's the actual hinge that allows because the the Burgundy do not control the Prince Bishopric of Liège. So if they had to pass into um, I don't know, Flanders, for example, they had to pass through these territories, through the non Brussels, Mons, uh, and so Brabant was the largest uh, feudal policy there, then. Uh, also, also the only one through which you could access uh, the north, the county of, of Holland, for example, or the Duchy of Gelders. Uh, the, that also was a bit uh, like there the was the, the, the county of Clev, um, the Dutch of Gelders in between. So it, it was complicated, right? Further east, you had immediately Aachen and Cologne and Neuss, right? That, that's why, in fact, the latter was attempted to, uh, to be conquered by, by the, by, by Charles the Bold. And, and you see, immediately you have Duisburg on the Rhine upstream, um, uh, um, I mean, downstream, upstream you have Cologne. So immediately the main centers of the Holy Roman Empire and Brabant is sort of the major landmass that from this lowlands can afford you to, to sort of even just establish some sort of logistical bases uh, at least it would bring most of the supplies, etc. And uh, again, the, the history of the region is quite fascinating the geography the political geography of it especially even more and uh, we will hopefully look at these other territories in any case you have the northern neighbor the county of Holland uh, already discussed in one of my videos you have the county of Flanders uh, I actually have in store the county of Artois 
is a bit more west uh, overall these mechanisms but uh, we'll have to talk about it the county of Hinov, Gelder uh, you know there's really a lot of stuff right going on uh, for today however I stop it here I just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time